let's get started. Welcome to the spring semester of the High Energy Seminar. Um, our first speaker of the new year is Jack Steiner. Um, he's now an astrophysicist here, working in CXC operations and science support. Um, Jack got his bachelor's from Ohio University and then his PhD in astronomy from here, Harvard. Um, he was then at the postdoc at the other Cambridge, University of Cambridge. Um, then he came back to CFA with a Hubble. He moved just over to MIT with an Einstein. And then after a brief, brief stint there as a research scientist, he came back over here. Um, he's an expert in black holes. He studied black holes um, using all sorts of X-ray instruments. Um, and today he's going to be telling us specifically about some results from Mixer. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so uh, it's uh, being back here is quite wonderful. And of course, I've been working on the premier X-ray imager on the sky. Um, but what I want to bring to your attention is a bit of uh, uh, a look at NICER, which is the I, I want to convince you is the premier X-ray timing instrument on the sky. So of course, while Chandra is capable of looking at uh, very distant, very faint things and unveiling those in new ways, NICER is uniquely poised to look at the brightest objects in the sky uh, and shine light on those in, in very new ways. So for those of you who may not have heard much about NICER, NICER is the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. Uh, this is its home on the space station uh, where uh, it was installed in June of 2017. Um, you get a, a very good sense from this picture the, the wonderful and the terrible aspects of working on the space station. So we have, we're connected to space station uh, infrastructure, so we get telemetry feeds uh, for free, we get power. But you might notice that there are some beautiful golden obstacles that are, can really get in the way of certain targets at, uh, at different times. So that's, that's one of the challenges. But uh, I have to say, it's, uh, the, the resources of space station have uh, really been helpful for, for NICER. And, and, um, it's, it's really been a, a very fun project for those of us involved to work on. So NICER is 56 silicon drift detectors. It is non-imaging, but it does have a, a single bounce concentrator optic. So we get a, a boost in the effective area from that optic. Uh, so these are all co-aligned to about three arc minutes. And uh, to give you a sense of what we can do, we have about twice the uh, collecting area of the XMMPN. So for those of us working on bright X-ray sources, this is very important. If you're trying to detect uh, timing features like QPOs, this means you're twice as sensitive to detecting QPOs in the soft X-ray band pass. Uh, so we're, in fact, also most sensitive instrument on the sky uh, to very soft X-ray lines, although we can't disentangle um, uh, within confusion. Uh, but below 1 keV, we, we um, have uh, the best ability to detect line emission. Uh, we are doing 25 times better time resolution than RxDE did. Uh, Energy-wise, unlike RxDE, we have CCD-like energy resolution, so about 100 to 200 EV uh, resolution across the board. And um, NICER is very uh, unique in that it maintains very high sensitivity to uh, faint sources. Um, it has uh, uh, relatively low background for uh, a non-imaging instrument. Uh, while it's also at the same time capable of handling the brightest objects on the sky without any pileup. So this is its uh, niche for science. Um, and I want to encourage all of you to think what, uh, how this might fit some capabilities for, for your science. So of course, NICER was put on the sky, the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, to tell us something about Neutron Star Equation of State. And the way that we've been doing this is looking at a handful of the faintest uh, isolated, or not the faintest, but faint isolated uh, neutron stars that are pulsing on the sky, so non-accreting pulsars. These are very faint objects, less than uh, a tenth of a millicrab or so, typically. And what we've been doing is monitoring the pulse profiles on these faint systems uh, with many megaseconds devoted uh, to, to the science goals uh, in order to get 5% uh, radii and 10% masses for a handful of neutron stars to place the strongest uh, constraints on equation of state to date. So this is just giving you a, an illustration of the sort of uh, things that we're looking for, these uh, pulse profiles from hotspots on a neutron star surface. And this is what was achieved in the bottom right corner with XMM Newton. Um, and then last month, we were very excited to put out our first 
release for uh, Pulsar J0030, where you can see by comparison that profile obtained by NICER. Uh, while our goal is you know 5% radii, 10% mass, we're not quite there. We found, uh, unsurprisingly, that when you get into the nuances, we're really limited by the systematics of sort of the models we put in for the Pulsar. So uh, you'll see in the top uh, left corner there two different models that work comparably well for what the shape of these hotspots look on the neutron star surface. You'll notice there are some interesting extended shapes. These are not also antipodal uh, hotspots. Uh, nevertheless, these are the models that are working best. So we're presently uh, at about 10% in mass and about 10% in radius with a little bit of difference from model to model. Um, and we have a handful of systems that we'll be uh, putting out forward uh, in time. So this is NICER's prime science case but it's not what I want to tell you about today because I want to convince you that NICER's uh, uh, prime targets, or I should say that was NICER's primary science case, but what NICER's prime targets are, are really the brightest X-ray objects in the sky. Uh, so in particular, galactic X-ray binaries. Now my science hat is, uh, is mostly working on black holes. So I, I will tell you about neutron star result, but I'm going to tell you mostly about black hole systems uh, because that's what I'm most interested in. So in particular, NICER can handle uh, systems that are much brighter than, than one crab. And in 2018, in particular, we were graced with a large number of very bright black hole binaries. This was sort of the largest collection of big, uh, bright black holes going off in the sky that we've had in quite some time. So it was, it was very nice that they waited for NICER to come online to do this kind of thing. Uh, but the sorts of things that we can do with NICER is look at time variability in order to look at size scales, magnetic activity, probe accretion. We're looking at uh, outflows and winds. We're looking at plasma diagnostics and using thermal and reflection features to constrain things like black hole spin or sizes of uh, 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 emission regions. And just uh, a little bit more on this, I want to show you why NICER is so capable of studying these systems. This is showing a comparison of uh, NICER, one, one kilosecond with NICER versus one kilosecond of RxTE looking at crab. And NICER is in red, uh, RxT is in blue. And what you see is that you get essentially this uh, very comparable numbers of counts. So 10 million or so from NICER, uh, 8 million or so from RxTE in the kilosecond. But you'll see you're probing a much softer energy window. So you get uh, comparable numbers of counts, uh, but you have, oops, you have background that is uh, about three orders of magnitude lower with NICER compared to RxTE. So that is really game changing for studying uh, bright sources. And when looking at um, stellar mass black holes, this is showing you the classic Q or turtle head diagram uh, for a black hole binary outburst. If you're wondering why it's a turtle head diagram, uh, just squint a little bit and look at the top left over there and I think you'll be convinced. Um, the punchline is that in RxTE in blue again, you'll see that for hard states on the right side of this diagram, um, you get comparable numbers of counts with, uh, with RxTE and with NICER, but in soft states on the left, you'll see that you get about five times more counts from the disk with, uh, uh, with NICER than you do with RxTE. Uh, so just to show what that looks like, this is a typical uh, emission of a soft state from a black hole. This is just a, an unfolded spectrum for you. And when I overlay RxTE's uh, band pass on this, compared to NICER's, you'll see that we are really, with NICER, probing uh, the heart of disk emission from these black hole sources. Um, and just to hammer home that this is a really impactful realm of science, this is showing RxTE's legacy of uh, 16 years looking at 30 black hole systems over time. This is the wealth of diagram put into uh, something like an HR diagram. Um, this is the, the hardness versus the detected intensity uh, showing you here with timing information uh, superimposed in the, in the color, how black holes evolve and manifest to us on the sky. So this is what we're really looking at um, with entire new bandpass in exquisite detail with NICER getting uh, spectral timing information for the s first time in the soft x-ray domain and probing that accretion disk emission throughout this landscape. Um, so I'd like to begin bringing you into the science of this with a source familiar to all of us, Cygnus X1. This is, of course, one of the brightest 
uh, black holes on the sky. It was uh, the first object that was widely agreed to be a black hole on the sky, uh, the subject of a rather famous bet. And this is showing you a, a mere 15 kilosecond observation of uh, sig x1. And what I want you to take away from this is you see, uh, well, this is about 7 million counts in, in 15 kiloseconds. First of all, this is also a very faint, hard state. So this is about as undetectable as sig x1 gets. And this is the kind of information we have to work with in a very short observation. If you look in the uh, right corner of this, you'll see there's a very prominent reflection line that is, is not part of the model here, so you see it as an excess. So that's the, the broad iron line, one of the key means by which we look for either spin in a black hole system or uh, study evidence of uh, truncation in accretion flows. Moreover, you'll see that on the left side of this diagram, there is an exquisite detection of the thermal disk component. This is at uh, about 0.25 keV. This is something out of reach for essentially every other X-ray instrument on the sky, given how bright this source is and given uh, this uh, temperature window, something that RXDE could never have touched. So we're really getting exquisite information again about the disk, but we're also getting a lot of information about this non-thermal component and reflection. So this gives you an overview of the kinds of science we can do. And now taking you into a more synoptic view of SIG X1, this is showing all of the nicer observations of SIG X1 uh, complete as of a couple months ago. Um, and what you're seeing laid out in this uh, track, the red line is showing you what you would expect to recover for uh, the disk temperature versus the, the normalization of that disk component if uh, it was always at a fixed radius. If instead the radius was uh, moving outwards, breathing a bit with uh, m dot, you would see something like the blue line which is just parameterizing the, uh, some, some characteristic uh, direction and amplitude of that kind of migration. So what you see is we have uh, some significant evidence here that it's not always at a fixed radius, that there's a little bit of migration away from what we think is the innermost stable circular orbit, or ISCO, as it gets to faint luminosities. It's moving away, but just by a little bit, not, uh, not greatly. So this is um, one of the important things we're able to look at with NICER. Um, and here, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite diagrams. This is uh, something that is showing you a light curve, not of an object, but a light curve of an observatory. And this is, I've focused this light curve in on uh, what was the sort of most exciting window for uh, black holes going off with NICER, which was in the first uh, couple of years of, of observing, so about you know, 600 and change days into the outburst. And what I've done here is I've connected different sources for you in color tracks. So you're seeing a superposition of light curves for some objects, but all of NICER's observations in this diagram. So this gives you a sense of NICER's dynamic range, where the faint, uh, you know, isolated pulsars that are giving us equation of state information live down here on the faint end. Uh, but up top, you see we have a number of behemoths that are just enormously bright. Um, uh, things like SCOX1, uh, we, we can look at uh, challenging, but, but we do it. Um, and I'm going to highlight for you in the, next, uh, in the last few minutes of the talk a few of these objects. So in purple, uh, that's Maxi-1535, in green, GRS-1915, and in red, Maxi-1820. Uh, so, oh, and, and, uh, and in uh, the sort of orangish color, Swift JO-243. So those are the few systems I'll tell you a bit more about. Uh, with the remainder of my talk. So, uh, GRS 1915 is, uh, for those of us who work in black holes, it's something like um, the, the loudest rock star of the gang of black holes. It's incredibly bright, it's incredibly uh, chaotic, and it shows this library of strange accretion states um, that is almost uh, completely unparalleled, uh, unmatched in uh, the the array of other sources. So it is uh, a bizarre wild child that everyone is mystified by and is always surprising us. Um, this is showing you that classic Q diagram again. And while most systems spend very little time in this sort of horizontal track where they're going from a bright hard state to a bright soft state, usually maybe uh, a week or so is the, the transition time across there. That's where Juris 1915 lives. 
in this unstable branch where it's very bright. And while it's, uh, while it's living in this unstable branch, um, we see it go through patterns of accretion that look something like this. So these are uh, patterns of bizarre uh, hardness and intensity that it knows about. It can cycle and repeat to these things. It can leave these states and then come back to them months, years later. So these are uh, stable, unstable configurations that it somehow knows to uh, reside in. It's very, uh, very interesting, very perplexing. There are about 25 Greek states here for these, these uh, unusual classes of behavior. So I'm not going to take you through all of those. I just, uh, and I should say this is uh, earlier work with RxDE. But I just want to give you a sense of uh, what is so bizarre and interesting about GRS 1915, highlighting uh, the color-color diagrams in the top panels here, light curves in the bottom panels. So very bizarre behavior. So previously what we'd done, um, some very heroic work by Joey Nielsen, uh, I should say, what Joey had done was uh, taken the most well-behaved of those patterns uh, in the bottom left there, the, the heartbeat state or rho, and he'd phase folded them because it was sort of the one state where you could really cleanly phase fold things. There's still a bit of stretching involved um, to match the time scales. But he, he put it onto a phase, binned up the data, and was able to look at what changes in the spectral model over the course of those bizarre pulsations. And you see here, like SIGX1, there's sort of a breathing mode, except this is happening on very fast time scales, something like 50 seconds. With NICER, by contrast, what we can do is actually do the same kind of analysis, but in real time, and f not be restricted to only the periodic uh, uh, states. So this is showing you just a three-second observation with NICER of GRS 1915, and, and you know the statistics obviously are not great, but I hope you'll agree that this is sufficient um, to model uh, a, a thermal component here. And these are the kinds of states that we've seen with, with NICER. So we've seen things that are very boring, uh, vanilla, where behavior is constant. We've seen things that look like that heartbeat state that are sort of sinusoidal. And this is now not phase folded, but this is each three seconds or so getting a, a new data point, fitting a, a new data point to each uh, time segment here. So monitoring in something like real time what is going on. And then these are very bizarre states that don't have a clean sinusoidal, uh, there, there's no clean way to phase these things up. And we've been able to do the same sort of analysis and show for the first time that the kind of behavior we saw in the heartbeat state with RxTE looks like it's also a breathing mode in these uh, non-periodic uh, states. So this is um, bringing us into a new kind of spectral timing domain. And uh, this has been very exciting for us looking at GRS 1915, which I also just want to add, um, I didn't have time to do this justice, but GRS 1915 looks like it might be turning off for the first time uh, in about 25 years. It's been getting fainter and fainter and fainter, um, at the same time showing these brilliant bright outbursts, even as it uh, is declining in its steady emission. So stay tuned for uh, how GRS 1915 will surprise us next. Um, one of the next exciting discoveries that we've had with, uh, with NICER was the, the uh, first neutron star ULX pulsar uh, detected in our galaxy. So this is SWIFT JO243, and this is showing you um, uh, data from NICER, a very nice analysis published a couple of years ago by uh, Colleen Wilson-Hodge, where she measured the uh, spin period increasing um, over the course of a brilliantly bright outburst. Um, it, it reached a few times Eddington, uh, uh, well, I should say a few times above 10 to the 39. So this is a bona fide uh, Super Eddington ULX source. And you see its light curve in the bottom panel and the evolution in the spin of this uh, neutron star up top. And what she was able to do, putting together data from uh, NICER and other observatories, was model the evolution in time of the, uh, uh, of the, pulse, the pulse profile of this neutron star. So uh, I can't take you through the details of all of this, but I just want to give you a sense of the kind of behavior that was seen and uh, the robustness with which this was able to be modeled, because this is just a phenomenal data set. We haven't seen anything like this kind of quality, and it's uh, the first time, again, that we've seen uh, a neutron star ULX in our own galaxy. So the, you'll notice that uh, the, post, uh, the pulse profile is rather symmetric early on in the outburst. Uh, and I'm going to march you through time here. So this is showing you time 
uh, moving left to right and energy moving top to bottom. And I'm just going to play for you sort of a sequence here to show you how it goes from double peaked to single peaked in the pulse profile. And the energy dependence of that evolves as well. So this was a phenomenal kind of data set, uh, something that, um, you know, it, people working in this field of, uh, of, of bright uh, neutron star pulsar systems, I don't think there's a data set that's even close to this kind of quality. Um, and I want to now just introduce you to a couple of the other bright black holes we've had go bang. Uh, these are new black hole transients in the age of nicer. So the first one I want to talk to you about is in purple here, Maxi 1535. This for us was uh, just dynamite for um, looking at uh, uh, power spectra and QPOs. So this is showing you uh, the strongest uh, signal detection of a QPO that we've ever had in a source. Now, I, I will come clean and say that AstroSat does a better job on this particular source because QPOs are a high energy feature. So wish we had some of that coverage too, but, uh, but compared to anything we ever had with RxE, this, this blows it away entirely. You see that enormous QPO at two and a half and then at five hertz. So these twin QPOs um, just moved around and played like a, a movie for us when we were watching the behavior of this source. So this is very nice work uh, by Abby Stevens. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, but mostly what I want to highlight for you is the behavior in the, the big top right panel there where you can see how these QPOs vary uh, while the source is changing in luminosity and over time. You see it appears, disappears, comes back on, and that these harmonics are moving in lockstep with each other. So we're learning a lot about how QPOs behave. We're doing a lot of very, um, I, I should say, especially Abby is, is leading a lot of very sophisticated uh, timing analysis on these QPOs. And, and we're learning a lot from, uh, from this about how the QPOs form and what geometries this is telling us uh, are consistent with the accretion system. Um, work by Adam Ingram is, is uh, dovetailing into this too, where Adam has taken um, the, the QPOs and, and phase folded the source over the QPO period and done spectral modeling to figure out what components are varying with the QPO phase. So this is complementary work to that being done by Abby, and I just want to highlight for you uh, what we're seeing from this sort of thing. Um, and now the last source I want to tell you about is uh, the magnificent Maxi J1820, shown here in red. So NICER uh, can handle without problem any source up to about three crab. So we had problems with Maxi 1820 because it got up to about six crab for us. Fortunately, with 56 detectors, uh, what we're able to do is, um, the only problem we have is that we start to, to lose telemetry. We're oversaturated. So what we can do is turn off about half of our detectors and only transmit half the brightness, and we're fine. So this is a very fun uh, feature. There, there have been other things as well that have come, um, turned out to be very beneficial of having uh, high modularity in, in the system. Um, but I want to get right into it and, and uh, tell you uh, some of my work that I've been, been doing on this source. Uh, so I took Max 1820, which has about uh, 2 billion photons, and I've broken it down into 5,000 second or 5,000 count chunks to try to get measurements in as fast a time scale as I can of what is changing in the system at very fast time scales. Uh, this means it's been analysis in a shorter time scale as about 0.2 seconds uh, when it's very bright. And for contrast, the viscous time scale for the inner disk around a black hole is about one second. So we're probing this viscous time scale. This is uh, a new, a critical new domain that we're able to, to enter with NICER. Um, when doing this, you know, we're limited to very simplistic kinds of models. So we just have a, a crude model for a corona, uh, Compton scattering a disk. Um, fortunately, the system seems to be rather clean and uh, even higher signal data doesn't strongly uh, complain about such a model. And just to highlight for you what we're seeing, I've color-coded uh, different phases of the outburst in, uh, uh, in, in the left panel there, and you're seeing where they map to this formerly turtle diagram, now dolphin diagram, in the bottom right. So this is uh, hardness and intensity uh, with the nicer bands. Um, and there are a few interesting things here. So even though the system is, on average, much fainter in the blue, in the hard state when it's rising, it's very noisy. Uh, it's flickering very rapidly, and that flicker noise actually means it, it can get uh, brighter in very short time scales uh, when it's in a hard state than, than when it's uh, at the, the brightest end of the soft state. 
So we've tracked all of this. We, uh, the fin of the dolphin there is when it launches a ballistic jet. So there's a, a, an interesting paper on that coming out by Jeroen Homan in the next year. Um, or I, sh I should say, sorry, in the next uh, uh, month or so. Um, I'm going to just kind of jump ahead and, and not uh, get bogged down in too much of this. But what I want to show you here is that that same diagram I showed you for SIGX1, we can do with now this very fast cadence that's uh, in, in, at the brightest end about a fraction of a second um, for all of the MAXI 1820 data. So this is showing you that uh, unpacking of time um, in, the, uh, in the dolphin diagram up here and for reference um, in uh, temperature versus normalization with, again, tracks of constant inner radius uh, overlaid. So you can see that the system seems to be having sort of a breathing mode as it goes from a hard state to a soft state, but it's not very truncated as it makes that transition. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking at uh, in a really unprecedented way for, uh, for 1820. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't bring my poster. Um, and uh, the, I guess the last thing that I will leave you with in this is uh, a very exciting piece of work on the same source that uh, Aaron Carroll had a nature paper on Maxi 1820. Uh, where she was able to take the very early stages of the outburst and look at um, the, the time delay uh, between a hard band and a soft band and find that the accretion lag uh, was shrinking. Uh, so this is indicating that a time delay between corona talking to disk was going down, which uh, is clear evidence that uh, some scale for the size of the corona uh, with respect to the disk has been shrinking. So uh, we interpret this as evidence that the corona itself is shrinking as the iron line profile of the disk was constant over this uh, entire time domain. So the disk was not changing, the corona must be shrinking. Uh, so we're seeing uh, this real-time geometry, and this is uh, exciting new science for black holes coming out of NICER. So with this, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, my takeaway that you know, NICER is this important pileup-free, low-background observatory um, that's capable of handling very faint uh, less than a millicrab systems, and also the brightest objects on the sky with no pileup. It's giving us unprecedented sensitivity uh, to QPOs, rapid response to the transient sky, and it's giving us a, a kind of view of accreting black holes and their disks that we haven't uh, ever had before. So um, please think about what you might like to do with NICER. Uh, anyone who's interested, come talk to me. Uh, I work a bit on the calibration, so I, I, I know that quite well for this system, and i um, uh, very happy to help out. So thank you. Because the space station flies like an airplane, the detector must have to do something to keep up to re be continually changing its pointing. Yes. Is that all under control? Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the repointing is um, is very fast. It's actually, I believe, faster than SWIFT. So typically, we um, any object we only get a continuous. Um, you know, 500 seconds to two kiloseconds or so on, and it's transitioning very rapidly throughout an orbit. Um, we've gotten much better with time at dodging the uh, solar panels and structures uh, of the space station itself. Uh, occasionally, that has, has bitten us. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, each orbit we're we're usually looking at um, something like five sources is, is I would say typical. One very quick question, and, and then another one. Uh, has anybody looked at super soft sources with NICER? Uh, that's a good question. I believe Kent Wood has been working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, although I, yeah, I, I don't know too much about it, but I believe okay. he's got a, a handful that he's been looking at. Yeah. Interesting to see. The other uh, question is this, sh you know, there's so many wonderful parts of what you've been doing here and what you've been talking about. But it, particularly impressive is the stuff that even goes back to the heartbeat state when, when Joey mm -hmm. was looking at it. This very short time scale variability, which you can see so nicely here. What are the ideas about how that is driven in so many different modes? Yeah, there, there are different ideas. A lot of them uh, involve sort of um, magnetic structures, like a, a magnetic tower is one of uh, these models. So it's sort of. Um, Pushes out the disk and then and then um, ejects some um, you know with some with reconnection some some large scale um, magnetic field and then everything drifts back in so this sort of cyclical process super and accretion has been uh, evoked here there are sort of a handful of different ideas of what we 
may be driving that, and I would say there's not really a consensus. And getting the regularity, I think, is yes. difficult. Yeah, the fact that it, it knows to hang out in this bizarre oscillating state um, for, for you know many thousands of cycles, so much longer than any Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. No, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, refresh my memory. On, I think it's 1820, the, 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 the 2.5 to 5 hertz. Yeah. Oh, uh, 1535. 1535. All right. Those dropouts are real, right? So I, I should right. say. Forget if those are real or if those are data. The, these are real dropouts. So it is uh, significantly not appearing. Um, but I, I, I should I should have clarified these are um, time intervals that are uh, sequential, but there are some time gaps between things. So um, th things have been sort of smooshed together, um, but this is not all continuous. But it does actively drop out and then get here, um, you know, with, within on the scales of the sixty-four second. Well, time scale time. yes, <laughs> yes. So uh, these are these are statistically significant changes that are going on. This is not uh, just a. Uh, significance changing or something. Uh, on the uh, 1820 collapse of the corona, mm -hmm. does that coincide with, with the jet launching episode? Not that, not that we've detected, no. This was uh, very early in the outburst, so it was, okay. um, let me uh, move to that. Oh. So this was actually just around here where it's uh, sort of in the state, in the top part of that blue state, so it's starting to move just a little bit soft. So it's it's softening, but it's still at this sort of bright end of uh, the the hard state. Interesting, though, this um, this coincided with it then getting much fainter. So it could be that you know losing that coronal support led to it dipping before it had the the major outburst. Um, we don't know. So we I should say Aaron has. Uh, student, uh, Jing Yi Wang, who's working on extending that analysis to the rest of this uh, magnificent data set. All right. Let's thank Jack again. Um, and while they're transitioning, I'll introduce our next speaker, who's Paul Hemphill. Um, he's a postdoc over at MIT. Um, Paul got his bachelor's at UCLA and then his PhD from uh, UC San Diego, um, where he was working with Richard Rothschild on uh, cyclotron lines in X-ray binaries. So he's an expert especially on neutron star X-ray binaries, um, and uh, now is really focused on X-ray spectroscopy of neutron star XRBs. Um, today, he's gonna be telling us about accretion in ultra-compact X-ray binaries, toward a unified picture of 4U-1626-67. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm kind of wondering if NICER is gonna change their mission badge now that we know the pulsars don't look like pulsars. Um, <laughs> so um, we're gonna go sort of into a deeper look at a single source, um, and not with NICER, um, with Chandra, in fact. So this is some work that I've been working on since I came to MIT with uh, Norbert Schultz, Deepto Chakrabarty, and Herman Marshall. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, oh, these slides are out of order, that's fine. Uh, here's an outline. <laughs> I'm gonna go through the talk sort of in title order. First I'll talk about what ultra-compact X-ray binaries are, and then I'll talk about 1626, as you might expect. Um, so here's a rough outline of, of uh, the, the, the order of events. Um, going back in time, ultra-compact X-ray binaries. So these are a subclass of low-mass X-ray binaries. They are um, characterized by, unsurprisingly, having an ultra-compact uh, binary orbit, less than about 80 minutes. Um, they all have, we believe, neutron star creators, or I think they're nearly all of them are, are uh, pulsars, or at least we detect the pulse period. Um, they have some sort of a hydrogen depleted donor. Um, do I have a pointer up here or do I just, do I just flail? Um, okay, good. Um, so they have a hydrogen depleted donor. The, they're, they're sort of a sister system to these, which are the AM can bends, which have new, uh, white dwarf accretors. Um, uh, over here you see a sample of um, UCXB mass transfer rates versus orbital periods that Craig Henke put together. Um, and you can see that most of them follow along sort of 
these theoretical white dwarf um, evolution, evolutionary tracks in terms of average uh, mass transfer rate, but there's a handful of ones uh, at the longer uh, orbital periods that are at sort of abnormally high rates. And these are based on long-term average um, X-ray light curves. So they are hopefully a good proxy for the, the, the overall mass transfer rate. Um, some of them are transients. Uh, transients are the triangles on this plot. Some of them are uh, persistent. Those are the circles. Some of them are bursters, as in thermonuclear bursts. Some of them aren't. Some of them are millisecond pulsars. Some of them aren't. It's hard to really figure out what actually unifies them as a class. Some are in globular clusters. Some are in the disks. Some are in the core. Um, and especially when there's only about two dozen of them, uh, it's sort of difficult figuring this out. Figuring this out. So I'm going to look at one object. That object is uh, this one right here. 4U 1626 minus 67. It is unique among the uh, UCXBs in that it's the only uh, UCXB that hosts a slow magnetized X-ray pulsar. The other ones all have, uh, many of them have uh, detected pulse periods. 1626 is at 7.7 .7 seconds. It also has a 4 teragauss field. That's what this big dip here tells us. That's a cyclotron resonance scattering feature. It's at about 40 keV, so that translates in the end to about a 4 teragauss magnetic field. So by all accounts, it looks like it's a young neutron star. But it's got this hydrogen-depleted, ultra-low mass, um, probably white dwarf companion, which uh, looks very old. Um, it's been largely, it's been persistently emitting x-rays for the past 50 years or so. It's never faded into quiescence, but it is variable. Um, and there's no hydrogen and there's no helium in the visible and the, and the UV. That's a HST and VLT spectrum there. Um, the only emission lines that you can see in that are uh, telluric, I believe. Um, this here, this plot unfortunately is a little bit hard to see on a screen, but this is the pulse period history of 1626. Um, it was discovered in a spin-up state, then it transitioned to spinning down, slowing down, and then in 2008 it transitioned again to spin-up. This is the flux over that same time period, and you can see that it was declining steadily in flux, and then it jumped up in 2008. And that's sort of the thing that's interesting about, uh, or that's why we're, we're, we're looking at it now. Um, and you can see that like uh, around here, when Miriam Krauss was looking at it, she had predicted that it was going to fade into quiescence because, I mean, that was the clear behavior until, until now. But we know that X-ray binaries are weird, unpredictable beasts. Um, so this work, we're focusing on the post-torque reversal Chandra gratings data, HTGS and LETGS. This is the LETGS spectrum, because it's the prettiest one that I had on hand. Um, you do see some of the effective area of the LETGS over there. That big spike isn't real. The real things are these massive, bright emission lines Neon, oxygen, um, and then the real interesting thing is also that there's none of those iron lines that you usually expect over here. Iron 17 or so, these 15 to 16 angstrom lines. You only see these neon and oxygen features. Um, <clears throat> here's a comparison of pre and post torque reversal. So this is showing that increase in flux. Um, the neon line is the easiest one to look at. That's the spectrum, and that's the residuals to a, a, a continuum fit. Um, the continuum flux jumped by a factor of a few. The line flux jumped by a factor of, I think, eight or so, um, depending on which two observations you pick. Um, so the lines increase disproportionately in flux um, over the jump. You can also see very nicely, and you can see here even better, that the uh, hydrogen-like lines, neon 10 and oxygen 8, are double peaked, um, very obviously double peaked. Um, we can only really see this with high resolution data um, from Chandra. Um, previously, we knew that the lines were broad, but this really, really clearly shows this sort of disk line profile with a width of a few thousand kilometers per second. Um, so first step here was to fit the line profiles. Um, and get the uh, disk parameters from this, the inner disk radius and the uh, inclination. Um, once we have those, uh, we could go in and fit the helium-like triplets. And you can see that, so this is taking the 
line profile, the, the, the disk parameters that we get from the hydrogen-like lines, fixing them, and then fitting the uh, helium-like triplets. And you can see that they overlap quite a bit. Um, and if you go back to old papers, you generally find people saying that the inner combination line of, say, neon is the brightest feature in this uh, complex. But when you actually account for the blurring by the disk, the red and the blue wings of the uh, resonance and forbidden transitions actually make up for that, uh, produce that, that strong peak in the middle. Um, so these lines are actually dominated by this resonance line, which drastically changes how you interpret like what kind of plasma you're looking at. Um, the INF lines are weak. We can't really get anything out of the R ratio, and there's a lot of UV flux in the system anyway. But the G ratio, um, the, uh, the ratio of, the, of the, the forbidden intercombination to the resonance line, and also the he helium-like to hydrogen-like ratio, both seem to be consistent with very high temperatures. So this sort of suggests that we're looking at something that approximates a, uh, some sort of collisionally ionized um, hot plasma. Um, so the idea is let's start to try to actually delve into these spectra and get a really, you know, as, go as good of a picture as we can of what kind of plasma we're, we're, we're looking at here. Because these lines are very, very bright. It's hard to figure out like what system could produce this many photons from the emission lines. Um, so going down, this doesn't sort of um, show every single model that we looked at, but it does show sort of a selection of why different ones don't work. At the top, you have an attempt at doing some sort of photoionized, we're using Photimis, which is the, an XSTAR based model. Generally speaking, what we find when we attempt to, to do this is we get this very strong recombination uh, feature from neon. Uh, you can also see it from oxygen there, um, which is, uh, it, it's very difficult to get the neon flux high enough without having that um, recombination feature showing up. Um, single temperature apex starts to do a little bit better. You still don't get the, um, the triplets exactly right. You don't get enough neon. So in the end, what we have to use is a two temperature plasma. Without a two temperature plasma, you can't replicate the oxygen, the helium-like oxygen triplet while simultaneously getting the neon features correct. But we also need to enhance the neon abundance by about a factor of three or so. Um, and this, for the most part, does well. Um, it's got some uh, little issues that I'll address later on. So here's sort of the most interesting part of the spectrum uh, with our best approximation of uh, the source model. You can see uh, neon 10, neon 9, oxygen 8, oxygen 7. Um, and with the exception of a little bit of extra emission at 17 angstroms that this model can't really seem to produce, and too much Lyman beta from neon, this does very, very well. Temperatures are about 13 and 2 megakelvin, so that's in line with what the triplets were sort of suggesting, which is not surprising since the APEC plasma um, works on the same uh, principles. About three and a half times higher neon abundance and about a factor of 10 lower iron and magnesium. Magnesium is at, a, uh, is at an, uh, an upper limit and iron is, the fit claims it's a precise number, but I, I really think it's more of an upper limit in reality. That's relative to the solar oxygen abundance because again, there's no hydrogen in this system. So metallicity and abundance are tricky little um, concepts. So, what we're doing is we're fitting a APEC plasma that's blurred by the accretion disk. So we're simultaneously fitting all of the line profiles and getting the disk parameters, and we're getting the plasma parameters. Um, we do this by, by blurring the APEC, convolving APEC with, a, with an RD blur model, which is a Kerr metric. Um, totally appropriate for a neutron star. Uh, zoom in on the oxygen eight line because it's pretty and convenient. You can see that we get a fit to the profile very, very nicely. Um, we find an inner disk radius of about 3,000 kilometers. Um, there's a few radii that are of interest in a magnetized neutron star, um, the co uh, in a magnetized pulsar. The co-rotation radius is where the orbital velocity is equal to the speed at which the, the pulsar is rotating. 
The alphane radius is roughly where we expect the material to be swept up onto the field lines. And then the inner, disk of the, the inner radius of the disk is obviously where the material is actually swept up. Um, we, if the uh, emission lines actually track the inner edge of the disk, we find that it's fairly nicely in line with where the alphane radius is, a little bit inside, which is um, consistent with what other sources seem to look at. And it's healthily inside the co-rotation radius, which means we're consistent with the fact that the pulsar is spinning up. The material is orbiting faster than the field line, so it's pushing on the field lines and torquing the, um, torquing the pulsar around. But we also get an inclination out of this. And inclination and inner, inner radius are degenerate with each other, obviously. But if we actually uh, look in a little bit more depth at the sort of contours of the two against each other, we can put a pretty conservative lower limit of about 25 degrees on the inclination of the disk. And that's significant uh, because that number has been a uh, question for this source for, a, for a, um, quite some time. Um, and this is why it's useful. Um, inclination, we get from this work. Previous work has, uh, has, has limited the, 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 the semi-major axis of this orbit to less than eight light milliseconds. In reality, it's probably somewhere in the one to two light millisecond range. We're looking at an Earth-Moon sized system here. It's tiny. Um, but combining the limits on our inclination and the limits on uh, a sine i for the system, we can place a fairly good limit on the mass of the donor if we assume that it's actually filling its Roche lobe uh, and assuming a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, as we usually do, um, of about 0.03 solar masses. So that, place, that means that the, the donor is something around 30 Jupiter masses. It is either an intrinsically very, very low mass object or a very highly eroded previously higher mass object. Um, so this is another thing that sort of points to this system being old and is again sort of in tension with the uh, X-ray pulsar itself, which seems to be young. Um, moving away from the disk itself, we also get a good amount of information from the plasma about the um, abundances in the system. We have to be a little bit careful because there's no hydrogen, so the actual abundances you get out of your plasma model have to be tweaked. But essentially, uh, what we think we can say is that we get an okay, uh, we get a pretty good limit on the neon to oxygen and magnesium and iron to oxygen ratios in this system. Neon to oxygen is about 50%. Uh, magnesium and iron are sub 1% relative to oxygen. Um, that's based on this three and a half times higher um, uh, neon abundance that we get. Um, the whole purpose of the LATGS observation, sort of as an aside, was to look for carbon. We don't see carbon anywhere. Uh, we see no carbon lines, and we don't get a very good constraint on the carbon. Um, turns out that's because at these temperatures, which are these gray shaded regions, carbon, which is blue, you're seeing uh, helium-like and hydrogen-like carbon fractions in the apex plasma. Carbon is almost entirely ionized at these temperatures. Magnesium is probably a good limit because a significant fraction of it should be in the hydrogen-like state. We see absolutely no evidence for a magnesium um, K-alpha line. Um, similar for neon and, and oxygen. We should be getting reliable numbers on that. <clears throat> so with the mass and the chemical abundances, we can say something about the donor star or at least we can start to, uh, to try to narrow down the possibilities. Um, the two scenarios that are usually talked about with these types of systems are the helium star and white dwarf scenarios. This is not a helium burning star. This is a star that was burning helium when mass transfer started. Uh, it can't be burning helium now. It would be uh, much too bright for the uh, uh, visible flux that we get. Um, Helium burning stars, you can you overall get a slightly larger object. It can sustain a larger mass transfer rate. Uh, Craig Henke argued in 2013 that this was the, the, the needed to actually produce what we see. Um, but we don't see any helium. The visible and optical spectra don't, the, the visible and, and UV spectra don't show any helium lines whatsoever. Um, 
this paper by Werner et al. in 2006 uh, said that the helium fraction is less than 10%. It's actually, if you look at their plots, it's, and you trust their model, it's significantly less than 10%. Um, so if this was a helium burning star at one point, it has to have burned through all of its helium um, or had some sort of a dredge up process that caused the helium to get to the outer layers, get accreted off, and ended up with a, um, a metal enriched core. The other case is the uh, white dwarf. This is where helium, uh, where mass transfer star uh, starts after core helium burning has completed. Um, in this case, you need to have burned quite a lot of helium because you need to have produced a lot of neon. Um, this has to be, therefore, sort of some sort of carbon, oxygen, oxygen, neon, white dwarf. Um, the problem is that if you look at people's models for oxygen, neon, and carbon, oxygen, white dwarfs, we run into a lot of issues with abundances. Remember that I said that the oxygen, the neon to oxygen ratio is about 50%. In a sort of canonical carbon oxygen white dwarf, that number is more like 2%. Well, 4%. <laughs> so we need something like roughly an order of magnitude increase in the relative neon abundance in this kind of op in this object to make a carbon oxygen dwarf, dwarf work. Uh, oxygen neon dwarfs, we run into the opposite problem, we have a very good constraint on how much magnesium there is in the system, um, but an oxygen neon white dwarf should be something of the order of a few percent magnesium by number, and we constrain that to well under 1%. Um, there are ways to sort of cause neon to sink to the core, heavier elements sink to the core in, in, in white dwarfs. It, it, it undergoes sort of a crystallization process. That's nice, that can enhance your neon by about an order of magnitude, but you run into time scale issues because most people believe that magnetic fields in neutron stars decay, and most people seem to believe that they decay on a time scale of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, and this sort of sinking process is something like a billion year process. So we run into some more uh, further issues with, with, with the, the, the chemistry of the system in this case. Um, uh, Craig argued back in 2013 that the uh, disk would be unstable uh, be long before it stored enough mass to explain the long-term flux from this source. Uh, there is a possibility that X-ray irradiation could, um, could help, but um, I think that needs some further investigation. So um, <clears throat> the, the exact donor star is still sort of up in the air, but I think that these sort of begin to sort of like narrow down the range of possibilities or at least start to exclude all the possibilities, which is always fun. Um, from the plasma modeling, we also can sort of try to look at the uh, ionization balance that we're looking at. This is some work that Deepdo has been, uh, been doing. So uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, say too much about it, but the rough balance for neon 10 under the conditions that we see in this system seems to be consistent with a very, very high density. Um, the place where neon 10, um, ionization into neon 10 and ionization out of neon 10 seem to balance is somewhere in the 10 to the 18 uh, electrons per cubic centimeter regime, which is very, very high. Um, the other implication that you get from this is actually that the Photo ionization rates and collision ionization rates are roughly comparable. Uh, photo ionization is one of those ones up there. <laughs> it's all the betas. Um, collisional is all of the Cs that are up here, there, and there. These coefficients actually at this density end up being roughly comparable um, and at the flux of the, of the neutron star. So it's a little bit of a puzzle why we see something that seems to look like a collisional plasma. So, in the last few minutes, I'm going to try to sort of like look at a little more critically at this best fit model that we have and try to figure out, argue for some, some, some sort of ways forward that we have. I previously mentioned that there were two notable places where our model fails. It, it, it has extra emission at around 17 angstroms, which you see right here. And it has less emission than expected at neon K beta. If I throw completely ad hoc some sort of photoionized component into our model and try to get a new 
um, fit, I do find that I get a nice little bit of emission right around here because this 17 angstrom thing that we see is actually pretty nicely consistent with an oxygen 7 recombination feature if you like blur it through the disk. This is really, really simplistic. The models aren't talking to each other. They don't have the same densities. They don't think they have the same temperatures. Um, but I think it does sort of point to a, uh, a bit of a way forward. The other one is that the K beta from neon is a little bit over luminous in the model compared to the data. We, it's pretty much flat in the data, and there's a little bit in the model. Um, this could be an indication that we're looking at a more optically thick plasma than APEC assumes. APEC assumes optical, optically thin. But with this very, very high density and, um, and sort of odd plasma that we're looking at, it could be that we're looking at something that is more in the optically thick case. Um, it should also bring up the point that the densities that we're looking at are pushing up against the reasonable limits the, for uh, what APEC and XSTAR both, um, both work with. Um, we start to get, I think, three-body interactions happening a little more often than we're comfortable with um, at around this point. So it's hard to say like, that we've actually answered any questions about this, uh, this source. It's the question of what its donor is has been, um, uh, has been a question since uh, for at least the past 30, for, well, since discovery, but really for the past like 30 years or so. But I think we're sort of moving towards it. We know that we don't see any hydrogen lines, so it can't be some sort of main sequence star, even a hydrogen depleted. We don't see any helium lines, so this conflicts with a lot of helium star models. But we also have this very high neon abundance, and this is sort of where we are um, really starting to, to quantify things. There is this question of why this system looks like a collisional plasma for the most part, despite other indications indica uh, that, that photoionization should be playing a role. The disk is also being hit by a lot of X-ray flux from the pulsar. So these kinds of effects, uh, processes should be going on. And it's a question like why, why we don't see, for example, a big recombination edge from neon. Um, in general, I think we need to uh, look a little bit harder at how we're modeling this source because what we seem to be converging on is actually a much higher optical depth, high density and high temperature, and hydrogen depleted and helium depleted and weird metallicity plasma that's going to need some sort of a real, like, a dedicated effort to actually explain. Um, this will help with a lot of other ultra compact binaries because many of those should also have. Um, weird metallicities in their plasmas. Um, 1626 is especially difficult because its disk is truncated by the magnetic field, which plays around with the uh, densities and gives, probably gives us this high density. And then we also have sort of the variability and the, these torque reversals and the decline and then the increase in flux that we see. And this, the, some pulse profile modeling that I didn't have time to get to that we published last year these all seem to suggest that we might have a warped disk in the system, which might aid with interpreting the, uh, uh, how the inclination relates to the mass of the donor. Okay, so, uh, yeah, good. Right on time. <laughs> Summary and conclusions. Um, these gratings observations of 1626 let us simultaneously look at the plasma parameters and the disk parameters. Um, with other uh, observatories, typically you would be able to get one of those and not the other. Um, but Chandra's sort of broadband grading spectra are, are really useful for this. Um, we get an inner disk radius that is nicely consistent with the sort of overall behavior of the source, the spin up and the magnetic field strength that we get from other measurements. We get a good constraint on the donor mass of something less than 0.03 solar masses. Um, and if we actually get a measurement of the orbit, we will be able to get an actual estimate of the donor mass. The emission line suggests that we have highly enhanced neon and strongly depleted magnesium and iron. I can't talk about other elements because those are the only ones I included in my model. Um, but those are sort of the um, strongest emitting elements nearby the temper in the temperatures that we're looking at. And we seem to have some sort of what I'm trying to call now sort of a mostly collisional high density plasma at a temperature of around 10 million Kelvin. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you.
I think at, at, at 10 to the 18, it's like, this is sort of the, the place where three-body interactions start to come into play. I don't know if they're enough to actually explain the, the issue, the, the things that we see. But there are a lot of... Huh? Did you try to see whether single temperature model can work if you also include extra interaction from three body or? The issue is sort of that we're, we were working with the models that are readily available in um, ISIS and XBEC. So that, that's sort of why I'm saying we need a, yeah, I mean, we do need to do a, a, a more careful modeling of the source. And if we had a model readily available that, that included those, that was, easy to apply with the tools that we were working with. <laughs> um, it's certainly something that I want to look at okay. at some point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's, there's other effects that I think might be more. I think optical, the sort of optical, de optical uh, optically thick nature of the plasma might be a, um, a stronger effect at this point. But ideally, we would we would we would fold some more physics into this into our analysis. Oh, yeah. Just wanted to ask. You, you said that there might be a warp uh, in the disk, and I wondered if, if that changes um, any of the inferences you made about the inclination. It absolutely yes, I know it does. So <clears throat> for the um, the donor mass, this relies entirely on the, the, the assumption that the, the lines actually try to track the inclination of the system. If there's a warp in the disk, the lines aren't tracking the inclination of the system. They're tracking the inclination of the, of the warp, the size of the warp. But that does make a, there is something we can predict from that, which is that that warp should be processing on some time scale. So if we can get high quality spectroscopy on whatever that time scale is, we should be able to see the lines possibly changing in profile. Um, we've actually got a nicer a set of nicer observations of 1626 that we just got last year that I haven't had time to like really dive into. There's some really big gaps between them because of how nicer looks at things. Um, but that's one that I'm hoping that maybe, even with CCD resolution, maybe even if we can, if, if the widths of the lines are, if, they're, if, they're, if they really are broad enough that NICER can actually resolve them, which I'm, I haven't, I'm not sure about, um, we might be able to see something. But there's also the possibility of just folding all the Chandra data together and trying to somehow phase it up. But I think that that would be sort of a, that would be a lot of fun. By which I mean it would be sort of a analytical nightmare. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time, but if there's more questions, please come up and talk to Paul right after. Let's thank the speakers again.